Funding for this program has been provided by the Nevada Rangeland Resources Commission. Successful Nevada ranch operations usually include a base privately owned ranch, as well as allotments of public land, which combined add enough acreage to make an economically viable ranch. It's not unusual for a Nevada ranch operation to have hundreds of thousands of acres under permit from either the BLM or U.S. Forest Service. It is the secret to Western agriculture, basically. Western ranching cattle. You have to have this portion of it to make the rest work. Being on the BLM for my ranch, if I can't run cattle on BLM, I can't stay viable. It's pretty simple. Wildfire on Nevada rangelands is a constant threat for Nevada ranchers who are authorized to use Nevada's public lands for their livestock operations. In 2019, Nevada experienced 82,269 acres burned. 1,100,000 acres of Nevada rangeland burned in 2018. Dave Cassinelli was just one of many ranchers impacted by the combined Martin Sugarloaf fire that consumed more than 7,000 acres that year. This fire started 4th of July of last year. 2018 and uh, this allotment size is roughly 30 to 40,000 acres. This one was a man caused fire which is even sadder to me. This is something that should have never happened but it did and I think you can see that all over the West in California, Idaho, and Nevada. Paradise Valley rancher Steve Lucas was also impacted by the Martin fire. It's called the uh, buttermilk allotment. It runs approximately 1,300 cows at full capacity. It's about 25 to 30,000 acres. We run out there for about a month and a half. It starts April 5th and we got to be off of it May 22nd. And from there we go to the higher country. That's the Forest Service. And then we run on the Forest Service until the end of September. So, but what got burnt here was all pretty much BLM. We lost some forest ground, I think about six or 7,000 acres. And then I also lost about 1,000 acres of private ground that is in conjunction with the BLM and the forest. When thousands of acres of Nevada rangeland are lost to fire, it not only destroys sage, grass, and wildlife habitat, it also takes a significant economic and emotional toll on ranchers. Ranchers depend on that forage for their livestock. What happens when the forage is suddenly gone? We have our uh, BLM allotments called Spring Creek allotment. 
and it's about 24,000 acres. 12,000 of that burned approximately, about half of it. And we run about 650 cows out there. And this year we cut that in about half. So we had to find a place for around 300 cows. Um, luckily we had our neighbors, the Crawford Cattle Company, and we ran them on part of their permit that they weren't using out on the Hawaii desert, about 40 miles farther than what we usually have to go. Pete Paris has been fighting Nevada range fires for many decades. The fire we had in 99 was really hard on us. We were off, we were off for two full years off the allotment, and that was with, uh, with the, in the sheep operation. We ended up that time selling half of our sheep because we had no place else to go. They were talking about giving us alternative allotments, but they were clear over by Reno, and there was no way I was going to run half my sheep here in jigs and the other half that far away. In August of 2019, the 15,297 acre Corta fire burned on Harrison Pass in the Ruby Mountains, southeast of Elko. We were directly impacted by the Corta fire. It's hard to describe the feeling uh, once you realize that this fire is, uh, is going to burn so much country. It always starts and you, you're always optimistic that you're going to get it knocked down and it's not going to not going to take up too much, but uh, but it's, it's kind of a uh, a surreal, uh, empty, empty feeling when you've worked that land and been there for so long um, to see to see the devastation. At one point, you know, you the optimistic side of me wants to say that yeah, everything's going to come back and it's going to be okay, and in a couple of years, it's it's going to be all right. But, uh, but in the meantime, there's gonna be some real economic impact to our operation. There's one allotment that, uh, that burned it pretty much in its entirety. And so we're scheduled to be in a two-year closure. It burned the cow allotment and burned into the sheep allotment. For the cattle, it was pretty much the whole summer allotment. We won't be able to go back into that one for a few years. For the sheep, it didn't affect us as bad. We can manage those sheep around the allotment a little better but the cattle won't be able to go back for two years at least. Emotions run high for ranch families during fire season, and certainly more important than the economic impact is the concern for loved ones during a fire. The first one is safety for everyone involved, like when my husband leaves at 12 o'clock at night to go fight a fire, you're pretty scared. and our livestock, you know, you don't know what you're going to have in the morning when you wake up or the next day. You have no control. Um, it's just pretty scary when the wind starts blowing and there's a fire. It's like you don't know which way it's going to go or what it's going to do. My neighbor came over and he said, hey, we just got lightning hit and we stepped out and looked. I saw it. I got in the pickup and drove over there, tried to put it out, tried to stop it from crossing the creek and coming north, but it, it got ahead of us. And then I just came back and uh, we started getting horses to go get cows moved. We had to move them that, that night instantly. So, cause it, it was moving pretty fast. It was a pretty low humidity and a lot of wind. We just got a phone call that said that the lightning had struck some ground uh, south of the old quarter ranch and, and that it was moving rapidly up the mountain and we had cattle and sheep both in that area and so we got over there and by the time we got there it had got into our cattle and sheep end of the allotments so we I mean, we just till 10 o'clock at night we gathered pushed pushed cows till we, we thought they were safe and we had them safe for the night Anyway, the next day when the winds picked up and the fire got going again, we got back in trouble again. So we kept pushing, come back and we started pushing some more. Well, the second day was the scariest day as far as from my perspective, because David had gone up um, to move the cattle a little further away from the fire because he thought it was getting a little higher where he had left them. So it wasn't too bad when he first left to go move the cattle and he was by himself with his on horseback and two dogs. 
And then within about an hour, it, the fire just kind of like blew up and it really became um, way more aggressive than it was earlier that day. It cro that's when it crossed the highway as well. So it kind of was went, went on like a little mission to start going and burning and started creating more of a problem. And so that was the scariest day for me because David's up there trying to move cattle. I didn't know if he was able to move them up fast enough before the fire started getting really aggressive. And it, start, it basically started raging at that point. And as far as I could tell, I mean, in my opinion, it looked like a raging fire. And that was concerning because I didn't know what his well-being was at that point. When Pete came home and told me what he had to go through to get to the top of that mountain, I was like, why do you do these things? But I know why, because he would do that for anybody that was stuck up there. And because David was up on the top and they didn't know how things were going and he knew that David was up there trying to get the cows out. And uh, he, so when he came and he told me, how he'd had to drive through the fire. It was probably one of the times when he's the scaredest in his life. Um, I was like, you know, you know, we're getting too old to face this anymore. You know, it, this is a tough enough life, let alone to go up and, and have to face those kinds of, of dangers. In mid-August uh, 2012, uh, brush fire started some distance behind me and burned for several weeks, consuming over 300,000 acres. Uh, the fire included all of the mountains in, in this vicinity, including Shin Peak and Observation Mountain behind me and uh, Ski Daddle Mountain to the south. Uh, these mountains are all well over 7,000 feet in elevation. We had everybody we could horseback, we had horse trailers, friends, family, hired people, whoever we could find to help us get the cattle out of the way. Leaving home, at three o'clock in the morning and getting home at 11 o'clock at night and switch horses and go out again the next day. It was, it was quite an ordeal. I think we did that for probably 10 days to two weeks before we got everything gathered up the way we wanted to. And we still missed some and we lost quite a few cows that burned up in the fire. This is our livelihood, you've got to survive somehow. There was gonna be an answer someplace. There may have been a time when you laid bed at night wondering what you're gonna do next or how you're gonna, how you're gonna survive, but Something seems to come through, and we're fortunate enough that, that we made it through it. Usually first on the scene, ranchers as first responders put out hundreds of lightning fires caused each year. Often, it can be dangerous. You know, our department, we've had a very active department for, for quite a while. My dad was in the volunteers in the 60s and 70s, and, um, and so we've had a very active department for a long time, and we've been very fortunate to have uh, good equipment. Um, the Division of Forest, we work with the Division of Forestry and now we're with, with Elko County Fire and they've, they've worked hard to make sure that, uh, that we have the equipment we need. We have two heavy engines and we have a water tender and we have a medical truck. And so we're, uh, we're fairly, fairly well good with the equipment that we have. So we started to engage the fire and the winds were very erratic and changed directions and it was at the point that uh, we could not engage that at that time could not engage that fire we had one engine that actually was uh, was burned over it was a fairly cool burn over there was no real damage done to the engine we had uh, one volunteer that was burned the other the other volunteer was able to to get away but uh, but it was it was very erratic and so we had to pretty much back off uh, regroup and then, uh, then we directly engaged the fire, but uh, we got uh, the west side of the fire pretty well contained, but, but the wind was pushing it uh, to the northeast and we lost the fire there. 50 years ago when we, if we had a 6,000 acre, 5,000 acre fire, everybody thought that was a big fire. Then they went to the 20 and 30,000 acre fires and thought that was a big fire. Now, when you look at this whole northern end of, of Nevada and Oregon, and Idaho, which are next to us, we have 400,000 acre fires right next door to one another. Opinions on when best to attack a wildfire can differ like night and day. Fires are fought different. We used to fight them at night. Those 5,000 acre fires, we were out here at night. We weren't out here during the day we were here, but we weren't trying to fight them. But when it cooled down, we fought them. And we fought them all night long. 
And that's, that's something the government doesn't do anymore. And there's nothing against the people. I mean, that they, they have a well-coordinated effort in trying to get this fire out. It's just that a lot of the teams and a lot of the firefighting men were around camp when they should have been out. And once they get out there, it, it's, it's, they're effective, but it's already too late. The wind's come up, it's hot. And I mean, it takes, this country burnt like you can't believe. The government feels safety should dictate how and when they fight wildfire. Ranchers, whose livelihood is at stake, often feel more risk is warranted. In my opinion, I, I believe that if they would get out there in the early mornings and evenings and get out there and fight that fire, I think they could do a lot more than getting out there later in the day at 10 o'clock or something and fighting. I understand some of their safety concerns, but if they came to the local people more, maybe the locals could show them how to get places where, you know, in, in dangerous areas, you certainly want to stay out of, but in easy areas, there's no reason that it should burn. They should go out there in the middle of the night and stop it in times. When the fire came close to my house, there was a bunch of engines and men surrounding our buildings. And I felt really protected at that point because we had so many men ready and just standing by in case the fire did come across and get into our structures. I wasn't here, I was up on top, but when I came back, it all burnt and there was still a bunch of people around here and they cut fire lines all around here. Um, you can still see remnants of where they cleaned quite a bit of vegetation and made lines all through this property here. Despite policy differences, ranchers and firefighters and hotshot crews often work together as a team on the fire line. I had six guys up there and the, the, there was one uh, team leader grabbed uh, they, their little backpacks, five gallon backpacks and their little pump thing. And they got them for my men and they, they got me like six or seven of them and they filled them up out of their fire truck. They said, you guys come back anytime. I told them where we were going. Uh, they went and checked the line. And then once we got up there, I asked the Forest Service, get a crew over here as soon as you can. We'll hold it there. And they finally got a crew over there and they worked that whole line. And, and my men walked with them and kept wetting it down and they'd find hot spots. So we worked together. Hundreds of miles of fences, in addition to wells, water systems and other improvements, can be destroyed or damaged in a range fire. Who is responsible for paying for what has been lost? We've lost roughly 100 plus miles of fence between interior fences and exterior fences, which exterior fences is a boundary between our allotment and a, another permittee. As far as rebuilding the fence, that is, they consider that part maintenance because of our contract with the federal government. We maintain all the fences, so they're considering a fire not a loss, but a maintenance issue. So we have to maintain them and rebuild them. Right now we've been told the Forest Service has no money for fences and so that we should contact NRCS, another government agency, to see, go through some of their programs to see if there's some money available for fencing. They're looking into some fence materials although a lot of the labor is going to have to be supplied by us, either done by us or we're going to have to hire a contractor to do it. Uh, a lot of the water development, any damage that was done there, um, that's going to be all have to be taken care of by us. For one thing, you got to get the material paid for. The people who bring the material, they want to get paid for it no matter who's going to pay for it at the end. I just couldn't afford to do that and so there's no fence as of right now. And like I told the Forest Service, I'll pay for the material and you pay to put it up. Big difference there in, in monies. You got $4,000 a mile of material, but you got um, forty dollars to $50,000 a mile just to put it up. And that's, that's, a, that's prohibitive, you can't do it. Replacing fences isn't the only cost. Relocating cattle and sheep also has its challenges. The impact is uh, pretty substantial financially. Um, because we have to pay for the trucking and extra pasture. Um, the, we, we took cattle to the Crawford Cattle Company, which was really nice of them to sacrifice some of their BLM for us. And also we took cattle over to the 
TS Ranch that uh, let us run cattle there because of the fire that we had. And when you take cows off of their their native range, they're not they're not going to perform as well as if they would on their on their own native country. It's costly to because your cattle don't really know the range. They don't know exactly where the waters are, where they got to go, where the best feed is. They'll find it eventually, but it's new country, so it takes a while to get acclimated to it. Cheatgrass is the primary culprit in the creation of the largest and most intensive wildfires. Ranchers and the BLM have found that livestock grazing at the right time can be an important tool to control rangeland fires. You know, every instance is different, but I think flexibility is the key to, to anything. And I think there's a lot of research that's being shown that actually grazing the following spring to reduce your annuals, it gives your perennials a chance to, to reestablish. And there's a lot of research starting to support that. Look at the fuel, it's everywhere. And unless they let us start grazing more cattle or doing something different, it'll be another fire the next year. There's just, it like it doesn't go away. Basically the, the wildfire could be helped a lot by uh, giving ranchers the flexibility to control the fuel source, enough grazing to bring that fuel source down to where it's manageable. So I think the BLM has been real favorable of coming on with this target grazing that they're talking about. I, th I think possibly if they let us do some water developments and uh, road improvements where we can maybe haul water or uh, even let us drill some wells would be a great benefit for us and, and really help reduce the fuel loads in certain areas. If we have a high precip year and we see more than X amount of pounds per acre of cheatgrass, then do we want to have some pre-analyzed response of, you know, increasing livestock numbers for a shorter amount of time in a particular pasture that has a large cheatgrass problem. Between outcome-based grazing and the acknowledgement and focus on the contribution that targeted grazing for fuels removal may be able to contribute, I think that the combination of those two efforts most definitely will be able to focus attention on areas that show repeated fire occurrence or that have uh, changed vegetative systems that are more prone to fire. There's a national pilot project that's going on right now and Nevada had the first pilot project involved in this national effort and it's right around the Carlin area. The whole goal of that project is to do strategically located fuel breaks that are created and maintained solely with livestock. And so they had their first spring grazing treatment just spring of 18 and shortly after that in summer of 18 his fuel break was tested and it did hold the fire. Do rangelands recover after a wildfire? If so how long does it take? The BLM seeded 12,000 acres after the Martin fire on Dave Casanelli's allotment. Has it been effective? It can be effective. We're fortunate to be here today and it rained last night. It's all about moisture in Nevada. That's one of the biggest problems with cheatgrass inva invading. Cheatgrass is an early riser, so it's, it's softening up the moisture and it depends on density of cheatgrass to what you have left. As, as we stand here, and as I was mentioning to you before, I do see a lot of perennials started here. If we move out in it, I see some squirrel tail, I see some grape leaves and wheatgrass, and, and uh, blue bunch grass, that's what we're looking for is the perennials and not the cheat grass. Even without seeding, rangeland grasses can return. Unfortunately, bitterbrush and sage, prime forage for deer and sage grouse, often don't come back. Well, we all knew there would be more cheat grass, more medusa head, but I didn't realize that the perennial grasses would do as well as they have. The fire released a lot of the perennial grasses, such as squirrel tail, what have you. Unfortunately, the browse is pretty much eliminated, that being uh, bitter brush, spiny hop sage, and sagebrush has been pretty well eliminated, basically, in most parts. When fire burns less intensively, the, it doesn't heat the ground as much, and so it doesn't damage the, the roots for the, uh, the grass plants or the or the brush plants as well. 
um, and so it has a chance to, re to recover quickly. Those fires that burn with a lot of heat and intensity, they'll burn the roots right into the ground and so it'll, it'll completely kill that plant and so it will not have a chance to respond. And, and like I said, in our, in our allotment that had already been grazed, um, it had been grazed and the fire burned through there at night with a lot of wind. And so there was not quite the heat as there was in some other places. A lot of the, the fire went through in a lot of places, the grasses weren't even burned. Um, a lot of the sagebrush, the tops were still left intact. Time will tell what kind of response we're gonna get, but, but right now it, uh, it doesn't look as bad as it could have been. You have to burn sometime, right? It's no different than anything else. The fuels build up, the fuels build up, and you have to have some fire. But our problem is anymore, the fires that we have are in the summer, and they run so hot because we have such a fuel load that we change the whole ecosystem. And when I talk ecosystem, I'm not talking mule deer and sage hen. They're important. Talk the rattlesnake, talk the lizard, talk the jackrabbit, talk whatever. The ecosystem will never be the same on this allotment. A rancher friend of mine that was affected by the Sugarloaf fire last year, um, afterwards we were talking and and he was saying how he was up there looking across the landscape and for miles and miles all you could see was black. And a quote he gave me, and, and I keep going back to it, he says, elk, mule deer, antelope, sage grouse, and fish do not respond well to black habitat. That statement says an awful lot. The federal government plans to spend up to $275 million to create 11,000 miles of fuel breaks across our western rangelands to help contain wildfire. Environmental groups oppose and plan to fight the proposal, while ranchers and wildlife continue to feel the heat. Funding for this program has been provided by the Nevada Rangeland Resources Commission.